Well, welcome back to the question and answer time uh, for our Westminster Conference on Preaching and Preachers. We are uh, delighted to have with us Dr. John Payne and Dr. Ian Duguid, and it's been a privilege to be with both of you today and to hear you teach the Word. And I want to thank you for your labors. I also want to thank you for the energy you guys put into uh, delivering the Word to us. It really modeled to us, I think, the priority and the passion for preaching mm -hmm. that we really want to come through in our preaching conference. And so we're very grateful for it and uh, felt like uh, we were edified and Christ was exalted in what you did. So thank you. We have uh, opportunity for some questions, for some Q&A. And so uh, we'll just dive in. And um, some of them are simpler than others and others uh, are, are maybe more complicated. But we, uh, I would, I'm going to direct these to you as individuals. But please feel free to uh, dive in and add your comments and and answer it as you as you would like to. So, John, uh, this is a real simple one. First to you, I think you've stirred a lot of interest in Charles Simeon. Mm. And so the question comes in, uh, what biographies, what resources would you recommend uh, on Charles Simeon? Yes, so um, early 20th, 20th century author, uh, Hanley Mole, M-O-U-L-E, okay. uh, is one, uh, kind of a shorter biography, and then an author by the name of Hopkins, uh, who was a bishop of Durham, um, Again, uh, kind of uh, early 20th century. Uh, those would be the two. Interestingly, um, I'm not aware of any sort of critical sort of intellectual biography, which would be very welcome. You know, it would seem to be a good project for someone to work on. Maybe yeah. this would spur on someone to do some more work uh, in, in Simeon. Um, it's, it's not easy uh, to get one's hands on his uh, Hora Homiletica. His, his, at one point, I was so excited about him, I wanted to just buy all those for my library. And um, uh, they're out of print, uh, even hard to find in libraries, uh, the 21 volumes of his sermon outlines. Um, uh, so, yeah, and then some more popular uh, uh, versions, you have uh, John Piper yeah. uh, in his, uh, I think, Roots of Endurance series. Yeah. Um, he'll, he has, a, I think, a, a chapter in one of those, uh, which can be accessed uh, as well. Um, so those would be where I would point people. Yeah. What was it that started your own interest in Charles Simeon? Why did you start to look into him, choose to write a little bit on him? What was the, what was the draw? Yeah, I think um, I had uh, read, in, in fact, J.I. Packer, in somewhere, I uh, had written a, a, a chapter on his preaching. Um, I, I can't, I can't recall at the moment um, what book that was in, but it was uh, intriguing to me. Yeah. Uh, I've quoted Packer, of course, a couple of times yeah. in, in my lecture, and just just the idea of of the kind of preaching that is rare in our own day. And, and it was rare in that day, too, yeah. we were learning. Yeah. Uh, but something that I uh, sort of wanted to catch the spirit of. Um, I, I agree with Lloyd-Jones. I think preaching is, is more caught than taught. Yeah. And uh, when studying the life and preaching of a man uh, like Simeon, uh, you, you pray that you would catch some of, uh, of you know, what it was he was doing and, and, and his own passion for preaching, his own understanding of what preaching is. So yeah. obviously Simeon studied preaching and taught preaching, um, and, and it wasn't something that he was sort of assigned to do in a seminary. Yeah. He took it upon himself to do that and invested in all these young men. So, uh, And then, of course, taking Jean-Claude's work and uh, wanting to popularize it with his right. students. I just found all that very fascinating yeah. and, um, and wanted to, you know, catch some of that in my own my own preaching. You know, when you were talking about how Simeon would have the students to his house and teach them mm -hmm. preaching, and, you know, I heard just this faithful model of 2 Timothy 2 2, mm -hmm. you know, imparting to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I think there's a model there for us in Charles Simeon of pastors, uh, how they can uh, exemplify that and invest their lives in, in the generation that's coming. There's no question. And uh, interestingly, um, when I was teaching uh, classes at RTS Atlanta on preaching for several years, I would, I would uh, refer to Simeon, and I would often ask the students, how many of you are, are spending regular time with your minister? Yeah. And surprisingly, very few of them. Yeah. And, uh, and at times, these pastors were in large churches yeah. where they were a part of kind of a team of interns. And they were getting, some of them, almost no attention from 
those whom they should be spending time with and learning from. And so I, I saw in the contrast in Simeon uh, a man who had many reasons to not spend time with these young men and yet made it a priority yeah. and, and, yet, and it bore yeah. wonderful fruit. Well, that's a great example and exhortation to us. Mm-hmm. Ian, a second question to you um, on your uh, doxological exaltation. And um, you, we know you, you have a heart for counseling and, 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 and pastoral ministry. And a question has come in about um, addressing sin and idolatry. So could you talk a little bit about pastoral ministry, how doxological exaltation, how that provides the foundation and the fuel for dealing with sin and idolatry in people's lives? How would you think that through, and how would you uh, guide pastors to think that through? Yeah, what the, one thing I've noticed is that sometimes when people first learn you know, the concept of heart idolatry, uh, they get very excited about it and, and, and kind of go overboard trying to wrestle down every idol in their hearts. Mm. Uh, and, and the result is a sort of heaviness mm. uh, that they're constantly, you know, second-guessing themselves. Con- but all of their attention is kind of curved in on themselves. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 the old, uh, it's the old adage of, you know, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. Yeah. Uh, I think what doxology does is it gets our eyes, I think you mentioned this, it gets our eyes off ourselves uh, and onto, onto Christ. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, that it, so that it's preaching that is, that is not caught up, not overly caught up with how we're doing, yeah. right? Because um, I, I think there's an individual sense in which that can happen with people too, mm. uh, as well as a church sense, that, that, that we, we're so caught up with how well we're doing with, with our spiritual walk. Whether, whether we're succeeding and we're proud of that or whether we're really struggling and, and we're devastated because, because you know, we're, we're not seeing the, the progress against sin that we would like to see. Um, and, 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 and I think that sort of suits Satan's purposes uh. to, to keep our eyes on ourselves. Yeah. Um, and, and, and what doxology does is it, is it says, Okay, so wherever you are in your spiritual walk, you, you're ne- you know, however well you're doing, you're never going to outgrow your need for Christ. Right. And however badly you're doing, you, you're never so sinful that Christ is not enough. Right. And so it refocuses our attention where it needs to be in a way that then, that then gives us the ability to plunge into the reality of whatever messy situation we're in, whether it's a relational situation or a sin struggle uh, because we have, we, we, our, our confidence is refreshed yeah. in Christ's victory and, and the fact that he who began a good work and you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. That then gives us the courage then to go back and wrestle with the messy situations in life. Uh, yeah. Yes. yeah, and I'd like to add, if I, if I could, you know, this is a really important point because you know, when, we, when we have God-centered worship and God-centered preaching, Christ exalting preaching, um, what it does is it, it, it turns your, your eyes away from self and sin. And, you know, one thing I will say regularly is when we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, so, of course, it's focusing in that text on his death, but when we, as pastors, set forth the the glory and the beauty and the loveliness of Christ in his person and character and work, then suddenly our, our, our heart affections are, are moved away from those idols and, and placed upon Christ. Yeah. And, and that's got to be one of the goals um, that we pray for is that our people would see the ugliness of idolatry and the, the beauty and glory and majesty and attractiveness of the loveliness of Christ. You know, yeah. you read Samuel Rutherford's yeah. letters, and you, you see there this uh, affectionate, uh, intimate language being used. And 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 so I'll often say to, say, say to my people, when you are when you are looking at the crucified Christ by faith, you know, Paul says in Galatians that it, the gospel. It's basically placarded before you when I'm preaching. Christ crucified was placarded before you when I was preaching. You yeah. saw that. Yeah. And when you're looking at a, a crucified Christ bleeding and dying for you, what is the last thing you want to do? Yeah. Sin against him. Yeah. Yeah. 
be an idolater. Um, and so as our worship is less focused on entertainment or making us feel good or on pumping the programs of the church or whatever, but our worship truly is God-centered, Christ-exalting, our idols are going to look uglier when we leave the room. Yeah. And, uh, of course, the idols will always be popping back up mm. as yeah. sinners, but that's what God-centered doxological worship does is it, it, it makes us more in love with God yeah. and, and, and more appreciative of who he is and yeah. what he's done for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. You know, you mentioned um, Samuel Rutherford in the context of the loveliness of Christ. Mm -hmm. And there's that little book that's actually put out by Banner of Truth, mm -hmm. just that little thing, and maybe this is an opportunity to commend it to our, our mm -hmm. viewers. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, excerpts from his letters. And I've gone through it a couple of times, and it's actually become a staple for me to give to those who are suffering mm -hmm. and those who are struggling and just have them read through the loveliness of Christ. And if you go through mine, I won't show it to you. If you go through mine, there's highlighted portions. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that whole, the whole, uh, the sufficiency of the Savior, the loveliness of the Savior as we go through the storms of life. And, you know, Rutherford loves to use the, the nautical images as he was, you know, looking out at the shore and, uh, and that, that, that west, that coast of Scotland uh, the weather. And it's just, it's just a great little volume. But mentioning the affections, we have some, uh, you, you both emphasize this in your, in your messages today. And I'd like to ask you both to speak about it just a little bit, or a lot if you'd like. Um, uh, you talked about, uh, uh, John, you talked about, uh, you, I think it was Dorothy Sayers you quoted, said, doctrine is the drama. And, uh, and, and Ian, in your, in your first message, you, you, you came to this uh, lovely point where you talked about Paul in Romans summoning his inner Moses and his inner Isaiah um, and, and, and exalting in doxology. Um, and then we talked about Simeon feeling the doctrines as he preached them. So could you both talk about, maybe Ian, you could start a little bit, and then to John. Could you talk a little bit about the theme of the affections? We were just talking about that, I hope Puritan language. Mm -hmm. The affections uh, in the preacher. How does the preacher cultivate holy affections? How do, we, how do we not just be, as somebody has put it, brains on sticks? You know, how do, we, how do we cultivate holy affections for the doctrines that we love and preach? Can you talk about it a little bit and then maybe John? Yeah, so, I mean, it's not just the Puritans, of course. It flows out of the biblical language of the heart, yeah. um, which is a more integrated concept than I think some, sometimes our, our, our more Western views of, mm. of, of how we think about ourselves, where we separate very clearly different parts. Yeah. Um, Thomas Chalmers talked about the expulsive power of a new affection. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, and I, I saw that demonstrated when I, I taught at Grove City College. You know, you'd see a young man who'd be obviously just kind of rolled out of bed and showed up at, at, at the lecture, and he's a kind of a mess, and you know, torn jeans and ratty old T-shirt. Uh, and then a week later, you'd see the same young man walking across campus, and he's got a polo shirt and dockers, and, you know, and, and, and you think, what happened? Well, what happened is a girl happened, right? <laughs> you know, and, and, and he, you know his mom has been on him for years, saying, you've got to shape up, otherwise I, I won't get any grandchildren. But that, the voice of the Lord didn't change him, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, because change comes from the inside. It comes from the heart. Um, how, yeah. The new heart ultimately comes from God, mm -hmm. you know, both initially in terms of, uh, of us being new creation and then the, the kind of the spread of the effects of that new creation. It's a work of the Spirit, ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, and yet uh, uh, the Spirit uses means, Right. Uh, and the means often that the Spirit uses is preaching, um, you know, reading good Christian books. Uh, there are some, you know, some, some kinds of Christian books stir your heart. Uh, and and we, should, we should seek out that kind of, uh, yeah. that kind of literature, uh, that kind of preaching. Uh, and uh, because, because often the Spirit will use those means to, to stir our hearts afresh. Um, but it's not something we can just control. You know, it's not like, okay, you can check, take off the check, right. 10 check points. Right. Um, but it is the kind of thing that, that, that generally, if we're pursuing the means that God has provided, yeah. there will be moments in there. It's sort of like quality time with your kids. You know, you, you, you can't, you can't, when your kids are small, you can't schedule, okay, so next Tuesday, 4.30 to 5, we're going to have quality time together. Yes. Right. 
But if you spend a, a bunch of time with your kids over the course of the week, I guarantee you, somewhere in there, you're going to have golden moments you're just going to remember forever. That's right. Yeah. Um, it's it's similar. Yeah. Um, we yeah. can we can put ourselves in the in the right position, uh, and 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 plead with God to to to, to stir our because our hearts are naturally cold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a, a great analogy with the kids and spending time with quality time. John, how, what would you say to uh, it, uh, current preachers? Uh, and there's actually a question here directed to you from a seminary student. As a seminary student, how do I, how do I get my heart and feeling towards the doctrines I'm going to teach? So yeah. what, 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 how would you respond to that question? How do you stir up holy affection? Yeah. So the first thing I'll say will, will be to piggyback off something that um, Dr. Duguid said, and, and that is it's first and foremost important that you are walking with your Father, your Heavenly Father, so there, there needs to be um, that consistent, regular walk with the Lord. Sometimes you will feel it more than others. Mm. Um, Lloyd-Jones, I think, used an illustration on this where he said, you know, when you're walking along with your father um, as a child, your earthly father, and he's holding your hand, and you're walking along, and you're talking, and you feel close to him, and there's a closeness, but there are times where your father just picks you up into his arms and yeah. embraces you and tells you, I, you know, I love you, son. I love you. And uh, you feel so loved and, and, and you feel that deeply when your father embraces you like that. And it's different than when you're just walking along. Yeah. Both of those are meaningful. Mm. But one, you feel it deep, deeper than others. So, but, but you have to be with your father for that to happen. And so I think that drawing near to God uh, in a kind of daily uh, rhythm of piety mm. uh, in, in, in personal time with the Lord. Um, there, there's, there's kind of been a bit of a movement in our circles over the last few years that, you know, it's if you're spending time with God every day or feel the urge to do that, it's kind of legalistic, you know, you need to maybe not do that because it's kind of legalistic. I, why would you not want to spend time with your father, you shouldn't see it as a time where you're earning God's affection, but you, you draw near him because you know you need him and you want to be near him. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to the seminary student and to every pastor, develop and cultivate a, a time of personal worship, which our confession says personal worship, family worship, and most solemnly public worship are, the, are things that we ought to take seriously and, yeah. and, and do in our lives. But that daily time that's separate from your sermon preparation, that's separate from your Bible study uh, preparation, and it's just you and the Lord. So, I, so, so for every seminary student that's studying theology all day long, every day, have a time where it's not academic. It's, it's, it's a devotion. It's you spending time with God, hearing from his word, crying out to him in prayer, maybe singing a hymn, reading some prayers. Um, and then for every preacher, don't get so busy in ministry yeah. that you have forgotten to walk with God. Yeah. And that is a reality for many pastors. They're so busy in ministry, they have forgotten actually to walk with God themselves. They're teaching other people how to walk with God, and they're right. not walking with God. Right. They've stopped praying. They've stopped spending time with God. The sweetness and the closeness and the intimacy has gone off. Yeah. And the way to counter that is simply to develop and cultivate a daily time with the Lord and to observe the Sabbath as a day of worship and focus and concentration. Psalm 4610, be still and know that he is God. Mm -hmm. And as you reflect upon his attributes, as you uh, meditate upon the gospel and what he's done for you, as you hear the preaching, as you sit under your own preaching, yeah. Yeah. and as you come to the Lord's table, um, you are going to have a growing uh, relationship with the Lord. You're going to you're going to feel it. It's not just going to be a, a soulless formalism. Soulless formalism. Yeah. Um, I want to stick with this theme for just a moment. And you know, we've been talking about expository exaltation, and to think a little bit about the expositor as a worshiper. And we've talked about in this last round of questions the habits, the disciplines of the earnest, as I would put it, the earnest use of the means of grace. Can, could you, you're both experienced pastors and, and ministers. We know historically and personally of pastors who've just had a hard time 
And you mentioned Simeon, you know, decades of just difficulty. Any words to pastors who are saying, I'm just in the, I'm just in the valley, and it's been, it's been trial, it's been suffering, um, and it's just hard to have uh, those feelings. It's just hard to be warm and not soulless. How do they come out of that? How do we, how can we, you mean you hear about Lloyd-Jones and, and uh, Spurgeon and Luther all struggled with what uh, Lloyd-Jones called in his famous book, Spiritual Depression mm-hmm. or the Dark Night of the Soul. So how do, how do we help preachers be worshipers uh, when, when that's the circumstance? Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think it, it, can, it can help to know you're not alone. You're not the first person who's ever had this, that we, we inhabit bodies. Our bodies uh, feel better, feel worse at different times. Sometimes there's a physical component. And, and I mean, Lloyd-Jones, the doctor of all people, would right. immediately flag that and right. get that checked out. Um, I think one of the things that uh, God is up to uh, often for preachers is reminding us that we're not in control. Uh, because if we were in control, we would never schedule that for ourselves. Um, and, and God sometimes wants to remind us that his grace is sufficient for us in the midst of our weakness. Um, and, and we live in a culture that, that exalts strength mm. and success. Mm. Uh, and, and more than ever, preachers are urged to compare themselves with whatever big name there is in whatever big city and however many thousands are coming there and you know and there you are in your little church in the countryside or your church in the big city yeah. with 15 20 people uh, and it, and it, it feels like you know and Satan is quick to suggest this this isn't worth it huh. you know what, what are you doing this for yeah. um, and I think uh, uh, as long as one of, the, one, of the, one of the beauties of these times when we're tempted to question what am I doing it for is that it, it that's a great question to ask ourselves but we can't really answer that when we're being successful hmm. because I don't really know am I doing it because this makes me feel really good makes me look good or am I doing this because I love Jesus and yeah. it's worthwhile hmm. whereas when we're not in that successful time when we when we feel like we're banging our head against the wall um, you know, we're like Sisyphus in Greek mythology who had to roll the stone up the hill every day and every yeah. night it would roll down again. Yeah. That's, that, that to me is an image of pastoral ministry, mm. right? Because you're never done. You know, you counsel somebody and a week later they're back with, with you and you, you, know, you thought you'd had a breakthrough and it's all right. You know, you write a sermon and there's another sermon to write and the yeah. Bible study. You know, it, it feels like that. Yeah. Um, and yet uh, the reality is that God is up to eternal realities yeah. in, 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 in our lives as well as in other people's lives. Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes it's in those moments of where we feel emptiest that, that God is reminding us that's, you know, my grace is sufficient. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah, I would just add that um, there are probably two different kinds of uh, or more, but I would say at least two different kinds of ministers when it comes to you know, everything taking place in the world right now, and a lot of guys are on the edge. And uh, I've heard of many, and, yeah. and I've known of some who yeah. have who have had breakdowns yeah. and um, are really struggling with everything going on. But there, there, I would say there are at least two personalities uh, that would need two different kinds of encouragement. Uh, one would be the sort of, you, you had referenced Churchill earlier, mm. um, fight him on the beaches and in the right, streets. Yeah. But one would be the, the sort of Churchillian encouragement, and which would not be unlike Paul in some instances, is to soldier on, yeah. you know, to persevere, yeah. uh, to not feel sorry for yourself, to not be full of self-pity that life is so hard for pastors and, uh, you know, as in, you know, we have the we have it the worst of everyone, and and I feel so sorry for myself. When, you know, everybody is going through a hard time, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. people in ordinary uh, callings in life are having to go to work every day. You know, yeah. medical doctors are going yeah. through, and nurses, yeah. first responders. It's a challenging day, and and so I would say, first of all, to the pastor who's just simply feeling sorry for himself, self pity, keep going, brother, persevere. Draw upon the strength of the Lord. Draw upon 
God's grace and his ordinary means. Um, uh, keep investing in other people and encouraging other people. That's where mm. I think we find some of our greatest encouragement is, is pouring into others and encouraging others and loving others and pastoring them. I say there's another minister who is on the edge who needs to step back. Um, maybe they haven't had a vacation in six months and they need to tell their session, I need a couple of weeks to get away and to disengage and to spend some time with my wife and to go for some walks out on the beach or uh, in the yeah. countryside, get some fresh air, because we all know that to do that is oftentimes to regain perspective and um, to have some time, needed time, of rest. And uh, our Lord brought his disciples out to rest at times, yeah. and um, we need to be careful that we don't drive ourselves because of a sense of duty in a way that's unhealthy. Um, and so, you know, you kind of have to figure out, I mean, everybody needs rest, everybody needs vacations, uh, yes. Um, but who are you? Are you the guy that's just kind of feeling sorry for yourself and you need to just keep going and press on? Right. Or are you the guy right now that needs to really take a step back and to take some time? Right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Let me shift gears just a little bit and, and, and focus on in on a little bit on apocalyptic preaching mm-hmm. and literature. Just some practical things, Ian, if you could just address for us. Uh, can you suggest, you, 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 you mentioned um, how difficult it can be for Reformed preachers to preach apocalyptic literature, which is kind of a, su- a surprise, really. We should, we, the whole counsel of God. Mm. Um, can you recommend to us and preachers and students who are listening some books uh, on uh, preaching apocalyptic literature or preachers to listen to as exemplary on uh, preaching apocalyptic literature? both in the Old Testament and New Testament, and maybe a follow-up, take them in whatever direction you want to. Are there some tips on how you can preach the apocalyptic literature in ways that encourage your people they can read this, you know, the way they can read this? So practical resources, practical tips on how to approach this genre uh, so that we're actually accessing it and making it accessible to our people. Right. Yeah, we do have more models now than we had 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, I mean, Dennis Johnson's uh, Triumph of the Lamb on Revelation is, yeah. is a really accessible approach. Um, Ralph Davis has a little book on Daniel. Uh, you know, I, I wrote the Reformed Expository Commentary on Daniel. Yeah. Uh, so there are some resources out there. Um, and so it, I, I love the question, how do we, how do we encourage people to, to read apocalyptic themselves? My conclusion is that people read the Bible the way they hear it preached. Yeah. And so, so if they've never heard it preached, or if the only people they hear it preach are TV preachers, that's how they're going to read the book of Revelation and, and Daniel. And, and they're going to, for many of them, is going to say, well, it's a closed book. Because this preacher can pull something out of, out of thin air and tell me it means this, but I, I have no way of seeing that myself. Right. Um, now, one of the challenges of apocalyptic is it's so steeped in the rest of the scriptures. Um, there was, a, I think, a 19th century commentator who said, before I write my commentary on, on uh, the book of Revelation, I need to, spe- need to spend 10 years studying the book of Daniel, 10 years studying the book of Isaiah, 10 years studying the book of Zechariah, then I'll be ready. Oh, wow. yeah. um, and uh, uh, there's, there's some truth to that, uh, because apocalyptic doesn't flag for you, I'm, hey, I'm quoting the Old Testament here. Yeah. Uh, it's almost always by way of illusions. Yeah. It'll pick up on images, mm. uh, and uh, mm. uh, it, they're, they're very subtle quotations and illusions rather than explicit ones. Uh, but often it assumes that you know where, where all that's coming from. Um, I think you can encourage people to look at the big picture. Uh, the tendency is to feel like I can't understand it because I dive. You know, I, I can't understand the details. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the way the interpreting angel interprets the visions, it's not caught up with the details. It's the big picture. Um, Interesting. And, yeah. and I mean, it's intriguing to me that, that, that children intuitively understand the book of Revelation. Huh. In fact, my son Jamie was fascinated with the book of Revelation as a child. But one, once we were in a church where in place of, of a Halloween thing, they, they did a Reformation event. 
uh, which they encourage children to dress up as their favorite Bible, Bible or church history character. And so you've got a bunch of little Martin Luthers and, and you know, Samson or whoever. And, and there's Jamie dressed up as the angel of the seventh bowl of judgment from the Revelation <laughs> with his, his, his bowl of lightning and, and, and <laughs> hailstones and things. Um, but uh, his fascination with it was, you know, I mean, even as a, as, as a relatively young child, he, he got the big picture, right? Uh, and, and since then, I mean, he's, he's now grown up and matured significantly, obviously, in his understanding of Revelation. But uh, a couple of years ago, he, he, he did a retreat for a, a group of middle school kids and did it on the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's not hard to do it for that age because you don't descend into any of the details. You, you, you step back, you give people the big picture. And that does help build people's confidence that I don't, I don't have to be able to understand all of the, the, the little details here it, it's it's like an impressionist painting, mm. you know. If you get too close and you see all of the the paint, the, the, the brush strokes, you actually lose sight of the big picture. Um, which is why, yeah, you, you can't preach three hundred sermons on Revelation. You know, in Romans, you can pick two words, but God, and there's your sermon. Yeah, right, right. Um, in, in Revelation, you need to step back and 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 see the bigger picture. If you take too small a section, you're actually going to likely to misinterpret it. Yeah. One of the things I found encouraging, in amongst other things, in, in your message was your note that even the inspired recipient, uh, the 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 author of scripture, needed it to be interpreted for him. Right. You know, and so you shouldn't feel hard. This takes work. Right. This, I really do need to understand the scriptures to do this. That was actually really, I think I think that's encouraging for the the average reader that comes to the comes to the book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have time periods, so you have you know time times and half time, three and a half times, which is half of seven, right? Yeah. But you have the same period apparently as forty two months and then twelve hundred sixty days. But the twelve hundred sixty days turns into thirteen hundred forty five days, and part of the point is the Lord has His timetable worked out to the day, right? Mm. And it will seem longer than you thought it was going to be, 1345 rather than 1260. But no human being can figure it out. Yeah. That's the whole point. God has it figured out. He knows down to the day exactly how long it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, but whoever, you know, whoever tells you, I have it figured out, mm. you know, or if they say, well, you can't know the day and the month, but we know the year. No, yeah. that's not how it works. Yeah. Uh, John, uh, I uh, want to ask you a question about in, in your last uh, address to us, uh, which where you emphasize the the spirit and the 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 efficacy of the of the word preached in the hands of the spirit, mm-hmm. and brought out for us how there it is in our confessional statements uh, the, the the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in preaching. I remember reading Thomas Goodwin's. Uh, uh, work on the Holy Spirit. He begins by saying, we've neglected the third person of the Trinity. Mm-hmm. Thomas Goodwin says that. So here, here was the question that was coming to my mind as you were uh, expounding that for us. Uh, has there been a neglect of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit and the Reformed perspective on preaching? If there has, why? And what's the remedy? I would say that, you know, in our in our confessions, if you want to call it the six forms of right. unity, the right. Westminster Confession, Larger Shorter Catechisms, Belgic Confession, Canons of Dort, and Heidelberg, uh, you absolutely have a strong right. uh, pneumatology in there. Um, uh, you know, the Spirit uses the means of grace efficaciously in the lives of God's elect. Um, you know, when you look at Calvin, uh, you know, Warfield called him the theologian of the Holy right, Spirit, right? right? right. And, and so he, as a kind of a founding father of our heritage, he certainly uh, emphasizes the Spirit's yeah. work and the means of grace. Um, as you go through the line, I would say you'd find that emphasis right. in various theologians who have written systematic theologies over the centuries. Uh, Warfield certainly um, emphasized it. Um, so I would say that, that it's, it's emphasized um, how well it is practiced okay. in, in terms of, um, you know, what Lloyd-Jones called unction, yeah. the, the, the praying and calling upon the Lord for that grace and power for the Spirit to attend the Word. I mean, I would say uh, listen to your own prayers 
of your elders before you preach, um, what, are the, what is it that they are praying? Um, I would say that one of the prayers that we should be praying in our prayer of illumination, you know, prior to, just prior to the sermon, also before the service as we're praying, it should be a kind of prayer of illumination as well so that we are uh, applying our theology of the Spirit to our prayers. Right. We're saying, Lord, we know that unless you build a house, we labor in vain. Unless the Spirit is at work in the life of this service, yeah. we, we will not hear or see what you want us to hear and see. And so, Lord, please pour out your spirit upon this service. Uh, work through these means by your spirit. And so our prayers become a kind of expression of our theology. Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest problems, I, th- I personally think, in the modern kind of Reformed world is um, our, our worship services are being informed by something different than our confessions. Mm which are, of course, that which we believe about Scripture. Hmm. So our, our worship services and our preaching are actually being informed by kind of cultural values, yeah. trends, movements, things that are going to be well-received and culturally palatable to the people that we want to come and those kinds of things, rather than really you know, praying for uh, the work of the Spirit in our, in our churches um, and saying, Lord, have your way with us. Not this is what we want to do. Would you bless it? But Lord, have your way with us uh, by your spirit and, and according to your word. Mm. True John 4 worship, worship in spirit uh, and in truth. So I, I would say that that would be a, a very obvious application of that. And then as we're preparing our sermons, you know, we're praying for the spirit to bless uh, our preparation, our understanding, um, that, that we're praying our way through our preparation. Yeah. Let, let me uh, move to a conclusion in our time by lumping some uh, a cat, uh, some questions under a basic category of the, especially the preaching. Mm. You both served as church planters mm. um, and pastors, and um, it can be the busyness of church planting, the demands of church planting, and the demands of pastoring can be so easy to become distracted or allow ourselves to become diverted from what you articulated for us and has been demonstrated for us, the priority of preaching in pastoral ministry and and the worship of God and the witness of the church and the ministry of the church. Uh, What can pastors do to maintain that emphasis on the priority of preaching? Flip side of the question, how do they avoid becoming diverted and distracted? And then there's there's a follow-up that was asked by one of our our participants, and I'll throw it. When when you're part of a church where you think there's a distraction, where you think the priorities are, things are being reprioritized away from the priority of the word preached, how do you approach the pastor? How do you approach the elders? So uh, there's there's a series of questions there, which any of you can tackle any order you want to. In the busyness of pastoral ministry, how do you stay focused? How do you avoid distractions? And what do you do if you're actually a member of a congregation where you think there is a distraction? How do you approach those things? Hmm. One, of the thing, <clears throat> one of the things my, I've heard my wife say a number of times is we find time to do the things we think are important. Right. Amen. Which is always, you know, which always convicts me because I, I don't go to the, you know, I don't exercise as much as I should. So obviously I don't think that's as important as I should think it is. Um, I think as, as a pastor, you know, it, it, this has to be a place where you're providing leadership for your congregation. Uh, and, and if you're fortunate enough to be in a church where they value that, right. uh, then that, you know, that's great. Uh, if you're not in that setting, then, then you need to work and teach and, and, and lead in a way that moves towards that, right? And it's not going to happen in a week or two weeks. Right. But as we see from some of these famous examples from church history, people, you know, the, these famous preachers didn't all show up in churches that, were, that valued the priority of preaching, right. Simeon's situation. Right. Um, and, and they didn't get there overnight. But, but because it was important to them and because they prioritized it and, and taught people, explained to people, worked with the, their leadership towards that, they ended up in a position where everybody recognized, oh, this is, this is really, you know, this is really central. Um, it's it's trickier if you're just a lay member of that. I mean, the first 
yeah, the first thing I, I think you want to do is to, is to have a conversation with people. You know, you, you don't want to show up and say, you know, the problem with this church. Yeah. Because yeah, I've had some of those conversations, and you know, they go down the list of fifty things that are wrong with this congregation, most of which are you. Sticking a church plant because there's nobody else for it to be that wrong with them, um, and, and and that's sort of a downer to actually to hear even yeah. the you know the things that you ought to hear from that, um, and, and and because there are seasons in the church where there may be all kinds of things going on that you ha- as a member of the congregation you have no idea what's happening, right. and and the pastor may be wrestling with all kinds of difficulties that that during the season have meant that he's not able to, to, to focus or to do the things um, that, you know, that, I mean, you know, there could be a, he, he could have been diagnosed with a disease or his wife could have been diagnosed with a disease, yeah. then they're not ready to go public with that yet. Uh, and so, yeah, so his preaching has suffered. Yeah. Well, okay, that, I mean, I think we can all understand that mm. there are times when, mm. the, the, you know, things are not the way we would like them to be. Mm. And so I think you really want to be listening first. Uh. Um, can they articulate? Can the leaders articulate to you what what is important, uh, and and why they think that that's more important than preaching? Um, and and some of those answers, you know, may may give you a conversation in which you have a chance to to push back. They they may convince you that I'm not a good fit at this church, and, and you know, they they passionately believe the Lord is calling them to do this, and and that's not what I think church is about. So. Maybe I need to find somewhere else where I'm a better fit. Um, but you, you want to go in to listen first yeah. um, and hear as, as best you can how, how they would articulate it because uh, yeah, sometimes, sometimes that will explain a whole a lot of things. Yeah. yeah, good advice from James. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow mm. to become angry in that context. Yeah. John? Yeah, my, my first thought is... Uh, preach more huh so the disappearance of the evening service is in my opinion one of the worst things to happen in in the in the modern church and I'll be I'll, I'll be more personal in the reformed church okay. so in my own denomination the PCA um, I don't know exact statistics but uh, it's a, an abysmal number of the amount of churches that actually have evening worship anymore. Yeah. So to maintain a high standard of preaching and a high view of preaching, not only in your own life, but in the, in the lives of your congregation, they need more preaching. Um, it was standard uh, 30 years ago when you walked into a Reformed church that there would be morning and evening worship. There would be an exposition of Scripture to bookend the Lord's Day. Mm. Uh, so you, Even in liberal churches. Even in liberal churches. Standard. You know, when I was growing up, certainly. Yes, so I would say preach more. There was the midweek service as well, right, where there was preaching. Um, so as you model preaching, not only is that going to teach the congregation that preaching is a priority in your church, but it's going to maintain in your own life that discipline of preparation and preaching, keeping it central. I would say to keep up motivation and encouragement, um, read, it was mentioned earlier, read good biographies. Yeah. Um, read about the great preachers and the great movements in church history. That is such an encouragement. Yeah. You know, take time every year to read, you know, four or five books on the Reformation or the Great Awakening or, you know, or early church fathers, Chrysostom. You know, read about the great preachers, the great movements uh, where the Lord used great preaching. Uh, in the life of the church, and that will be encouraging and inspiring. Uh, in terms of going to your pastor, I would say go humbly. Don't go with pointed finger accusations, as, as Ian said, a long laundry list of, of, right. of things. Um, I, I've been in conversations where I was just absolutely blindsided, mm-hmm. and my first response was, do you have anything else? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that all you have? It sounds like you probably even have more than these 12 things you've put before, put before me. Um, uh. But go respectfully uh. and humbly and, and, and ask questions. Uh, don't make accusations or assume the worst. Yeah. And then after, after that, you know, as, as Dr. Duguid said, if, 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 if it's a 
you know, different church you need to be in, you will soon realize that. Yeah. But there may be extenuating circumstances that, that they don't know about. You know, a pastor sometimes is is having a hard time with his own session, yeah. putting things into place, priorities he wants. Sure. You know, there are pastors I know that want an evening service that are getting resistance from their session. Sure. Sure. So there is a lot at play. And um, so I would say go humbly uh, and asking questions. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe we could wrap up this way. We've talked several times about uh, reading good books, and you've, you've given us Charles Simeon. Could, could both of you think about one biography or one figure or one book that you would say, if you want to be refreshed, you want to be renewed, you want to be inspired, maybe one that's been important to you, that you'd say, pick this one up and, and try to read it this year. Is there a book, a figure, a biography? And it, Ian, maybe you? Yeah, for me, it's, it's always going to be John Newton. Huh. Uh, I mean, the, you know, the little banner of truth, select letters of John Newton. Okay. Um, he is, to me, he's so inspirational because he's so grace-oriented. He's so utterly confident in the work of the spirit of sanctification. Amen. You know, that, that, that people will not ultimately be left unsanctified, uh, which enables him to be very patient with slow growth. Mm. Um, and uh, mm. he's, he's very insightful about people, which I'm not. By nature, I, you know, I'm an engineer, so people are a mystery to me. Um, but but as I as as I look at him interacting through what are just occasional letters with people, I mean, his correspondence must have been amazing. Um, that you know, I I find it, you know, reading him really encouraging. Oh, that great, thank you, uh, John. John, one that comes to mind uh, from the last couple of years. Uh, is Jane Dawson's new biography on John Knox, oh. uh, which I, I just think is outstanding. I have friends of mine that don't care for it as much, um, but I, okay. I, I think it's outstanding. Okay. Beautifully written, uh, very encouraging, inspirational. Of course, Jane Dawson uncovered some of um, Knox's letters that had never been huh. published, and she interacts with those and, and speaks of John Knox's friendship with this, this individual. And... Uh, uh, so anyway, just a great, great biography. Uh, you know, I, I just finished um, Andrew Roberts' biography on Churchill. Oh, wow, yes, I've heard this very, very good. I've which is a 982-page yeah. page-turner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so any, any who are Churchill aficionados, yeah. I would yeah. say, yeah. read that. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great work on, on leadership, yep. you know, both, both you know, negatives and positives about Churchill's leadership. But as a, as a pastor, I think, you know, it's important that we're always thinking about leadership as well. And yeah, absolutely. Um, that's good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, again to both of you for uh, your investment in the emerging pastors at Westminster Seminary and the existing pastors that uh, participate in our Preaching and Preachers Conference. And again, for your fidelity to and your fervency in how you have uh, proclaimed uh, to us about expository exaltation. We're grateful to have you with us. And thank you to our participants at the conference. We are glad that you have been with us, and we will go praying that uh, this uh, conference has helped encourage you and equip you, even for the next Lord's Day, for expository exaltation.